Once again, uh, welcome to Hope Community Church. Thank you for being here. Uh, We are doing a sermon series, a message series, whatever you want to call it. Um, And we're calling this series The Last Week. And we've been taking a look at some of the events uh, that took place in the life of Jesus uh, leading up to the cross. And so we've taken a look at a few things. Uh, Last week we talked about the Last Supper that happened on the last week. And so today we're actually going to spend our time focusing on the cross itself on Jesus being crucified. And so um, this thing, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, it's, it's similar to, to what we talked about last week about the, you know, the Last Supper and communion and there's this whole thing that is kind of mystical and, and we understand it in part. But if we take a look at the bigger history of what God has been doing throughout the course of human history, it makes more sense what communion is and what that's all about. And so the cross and Jesus going to the cross, I mean, this is something we, we, we know about. I mean, those of us who are Christians and even, you know, just people in the culture, they've, they've heard about this thing, Jesus being crucified, and we can appreciate it on a certain level, you know, at face value, okay, this is the thing that happened. But when we go back and look at human history and look at the ways that God has been at work since the very beginning of time, we can develop a greater appreciation for, I believe we can, develop a great, greater appreciation for the crucifixion and what Jesus did for us and what this sacrifice was all about. And so I say that because we are going to talk about the cross, but we got to cover some ground before we, before we get there. And we're going to go all the way back to, to our friends Adam and Eve, but we are going to get there. We're going to make our way from there to the cross. So just, just hang tight. One of the, um, the most complex things to, to comprehend and wrap our minds around is the fact that God like the God, the creative being, the one who like made all things, that he desires to be in relationship with us, to have a relationship with us. And in fact, God refers to himself as, as what? As our father, as our father. That's how he wants to be known. That's how he wants to be thought of. God is our heavenly father. Now, that's, that's kind of difficult. I mean, maybe it is for me. Maybe I should just be speaking for myself. But to think that this being who has no beginning and has no end, who has all power and all knowledge and is omnipresent, he desires to be in relationship with little old me. That's overwhelming. That's strange. And relationships, I mean, relationships are, are difficult. And the relationship we have with, with God can be, can be difficult and can be rocky. I mean, you know what relationships are like. They can be difficult. Stuff happens in the context of relationship, which I think is why some people are a lot more thinking about God in terms of, of just religion and not really thinking about knowing him and having a relationship with him and not thinking about like, you know, not letting God impact your day-to-day decisions and just kind of standing off at a distance and thinking, you know, well, when I say religion, I mean the thing of where you just try to be good and do good stuff and stay on God's nice list. I mean, that's one approach we have to God. It's like, I don't know if I could really get into a relationship with God because like, how, how could I? But I can try to like do good stuff. And so that can, can, be, can become a default mode for us as human beings. We kind of retreat back into religion and that way of thinking about God. When really God is all about relationship, desiring to have that relationship. Have I said that word enough, relationship? He's about desiring to have that relationship with us, flawed imperfect, limited human beings. Now, as I said, relationships, and as you know, they're, they're tricky, especially the close ones that are in your life, and there are things that can happen. There are certain roadblocks that can happen in the context of a relationship. Now, when I say that word relationship, sometimes people think automatically about the romantic relationships, like, oh, I'm in a relationship. That usually means like a significant other, boyfriend, girlfriend type thing, but I'm talking about all the different kinds of relationships that we can have. There's the, you know, workplace professional relationships, right? There's the family relationships. There's the parent-child. There's the friend relationships. And stuff can happen. I mean, life happens, and there can be these roadblocks that just kind of pop up in the course of, or, you know, of this relationship that, that, that kind of make you pump the brakes, say, wait a minute, something has happened in this relationship here, and we can't move forward. We've hit a roadblock. Something needs to happen. Let me give you kind of a, a simple example um, and this is a story that my dad shared with me. Years ago, he worked for, can't say who, but he worked for a company, he worked for an organization, and they had strong political ties. And so the employer told the employees during election season, this is our candidate, and as employees of this company, this is who you're going to vote for. And so all of a sudden, there was this roadblock in my father's professional relationship with his employer. He's like, wait a minute, that's not right. We got to solve this. Something needs to happen. 
And so there was like this moment where it was like, all right, we either got to destroy this roadblock and work through it together and, and resolve this issue, or we need to part ways. I mean, that's what it was. And so what ended up happening is they parted ways. That relationship ended, okay? And this kind of thing can happen, what happens in the workplace. And, you know, the workplace thing can be complicated because it's your employer and they're like, they're like you know, your boss has all the power, right? Because they pay you. They sign your paychecks. And so where there's a roadblock there, you've got to be sensitive in dealing with it. But the professional relationships, that can be one of the easiest relationships, really, when you think about it. I mean, family relationships are the most complicated ones to deal with and negotiate when roadblocks pop up because they're your family, right? I mean, if you get into something with your brother or your sister, it's like, okay, they're still going to be your brother or sister at the end of the day. All right? It's not as if you can say, okay, we're going to end this. And you can try. You can try to just say, okay, we've hit this roadblock and things were said and you offended me and I offended you and now it's just like, okay, we're done. But you're not really done, right? Now you've heard about times, in, you know, where, where kids want to rebel against their parents. And that's the thing that happens. I guess that's part of growing up. And, you know, there are the kids, I'm thinking about elementary school age, and you've seen the pictures and you've seen it depicted on TV where the kid packs up their, you know, little backpack full of stuff because they're running away from home. You know what I mean? They're five years old. Like, I'm out, I'm out of here. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? I think I did that at least once as a kid. You know, there's that thing that happens. But then you get the more serious level of that. You know, when I was an adult, the child would look back at their parents and say, you know what? There was wrongs done here. There are things that happened. There are just these roadblocks in our relationship. And I don't, wanna, I don't want contact with you anymore. I know that you know, we're still related and you're still technically my mom or my dad or whatever it is. But, but there's just this thing that has come up, this roadblock in our relationship. And I can't get through it. And I don't want to deal with it. And so I'm just done. And I hope that none of you have had to experience something like that. Because that's very difficult. And that tears families apart. That's rough. And then similarly, there can be that thing. And, and this is really, I mean, this is really sad. I mean, you've heard about parents disowning their children. That's, I mean, I just heard a story a couple months ago about that. There was a, you know, a father and a son, and the son was just constantly in and out of trouble, and the son struggled with addiction. And for those of you who have had a family member struggle with addiction, you know how difficult that is just banging your heart up against this wall. It's like, you know, we want what's best for you. We want to help you, and that can happen. And and so there was this father-son relationship, and the son just wasn't making the effort and was in and out of rehab. And and eventually the father said, you're not my son anymore. I'm disowning you. And hear me on this. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm not saying it. I'm just saying that's something that happened. And that's a very sad thing that can happen when there's a roadblock in that relationship. It's just like, okay, we can't work through this. We've tried to work through this roadblock. We've tried to tear it down. It's not being torn down. That roadblock is still there. This relationship needs to end. That happens in life. And so when we look to the scripture, again, I mentioned earlier that God wants to have this relationship with us. He refers to himself as our heavenly father. He sees all of us, everybody in this room, as You know, we are his children. We belong to him. He is our father. And there's stuff that comes up in our relationship with God. There are things that we do that are offensive. There are things that we do are wrong. There's roadblocks that we put up in our relationship with God. Now, I don't know all the details about your relationship with your heavenly father and what kind of roadblocks you've had to work through. I mean, I could tell you about mine, but, you know, I'd rather not. So what I'd like to do right now is I want to talk to, about us collectively as human beings and the roadblocks that we have put up in our relationship with God. And it all starts with our dear friends, Adam and Eve. Okay? When we read the book of Genesis, we read about how everything began, that God created all things, and we learn about the first people that God ever created, Adam and Eve. And there's a lot of strange stuff. If you've ever read the book of Genesis, especially those first few chapters, there's a lot of strange stuff in there. You know, there was people and God made, you know, basically everything out of nothing. God made man out of, of dust. He made woman out of a rib. And, and there's a talking snake in the book of Genesis. And so there's a lot of weird stuff. And some people read this and like, man, is this literal? Did this all, you know, really happen? And other people really, but no, this is all literal. This really happened. Now, some of you know me and know that I take the Bible very literally. So I tend to believe all that stuff really did literally happen that there really was an Adam, that there really was an Eve, that there really was a, some kind of snake temptation guy <laughs> there, and that he did tempt Adam and Eve. I believe all that. But here's what it comes down to. Whether or not you take it literally or figuratively, I mean, the, the overall message is still the same. There's something that happened in our collective relationship with God. There was a roadblock that was put up. 
And so just to give you some background on what happened here, I mean, God created Adam and Eve, and they lived in paradise. The Garden of Eden was perfection. It was like no worries, no troubles, no bills to pay. The Heavenly Father provided everything. And that was it. That was life. I mean, can you even imagine that existence? I mean, I, I just think of what it's like to, to watch my kids, you know, playing. I mean, they're not thinking about, oh, what are we going to have for dinner? How are we going to pay the bills? Or, oh, man, I got to make that dentist appointment. They're not worried about anything because they've got a father and a mother that takes care of this stuff, you know? And so that's what it was like for Adam and Eve. They just had this, they had perfection and peace and they were completely taken care of. There was no toiling. There was no work. There were no bills to pay. They were taken care of. But God gave them boundaries to live within. He told them, you cannot do certain things. And in fact, there's just one thing you guys can't do. There's a tree over there. Don't eat from it. Don't eat the fruit from that tree. And so what happens? Eve goes near the tree. And there's this snake that can talk. And some kind of you know, personification or some kind of embodiment of Satan was there. And tempts Eve to eat from this fruit. And he says, you know, okay, did God tell you you really can't eat any of the fruit from these trees? And Eve says, well, no, we're allowed to eat some of the fruit, just not from this tree. God says, if we eat from this tree, we're going to die. And the snake says, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. Don't worry about it. And that was like one of those half-truth things that the snake said because it was like they didn't die in the moment when they ate the fruit, but they did eventually die. And so the snake says, you know, listen, if you eat this fruit, your eyes are going to be opened. And you, little old Eve, you're going to be like God. So she takes a look at this fruit, looks pleasing to the eye, and she wants to be like God, and so she takes a bite. And then something changes in her. And I can't say this, you know, if you read the story for yourself, I mean, I don't want to go outside of what Scripture actually says, but this is what I believe about Eve. When she bit into that fruit and when she was changed, she did not like how it changed her. She did not like how her eyes were opened to what she now understood. Because she was an innocent both Adam and Eve were innocents. They didn't have to worry about stuff, how to pay bills, how to take care of things. They didn't have to worry about evil or how to deal with that. That was God's burden. And now her eyes were open to the darker realities of the universe, to the realities of evil, and to the burden of God. And it changed her, and she did not like it. And she was alone, alone in this transformation. So she took the fruit to Adam and said, you know, you got to eat this. Don't leave me here by myself. You got to eat this too. Okay, I ate it. I didn't die. You eat it. And he ate from it. Because he wanted to be like God too. Because it sounds good, right? Oh, I get to be like God. But it changed him. And after they ate from the fruit, they ran from God. Which, by the way, makes no sense. They ran and tried to hide from God. And they knew. I mean, they knew. This doesn't make sense. But it was like, what do we do? Now, what they could have done is like, whoa, we messed up big time. We got to call on God's name and seek him out and, and just apologize and say, we really, you know, you gave us one rule and like, I can't believe we messed up on this. But no, they don't do that. They don't seek to like, they put a roadblock up and they weren't seeking to try to like fix this problem. They weren't. They just ran and hid. And who can blame them? I mean, God is God. He did all this creation work. He did, he's all powerful. It's like, we, we broke his rule. What are we going to do? We deserve his wrath. And they hid. God calls out to them and says, guys, what are you doing? Where are you hiding? Come out. Let me see you. Oh, we're naked. Well, who told you you're naked? Well, we ate the fruit from the tree. Why did you do that? And so right away, there's this lack of repentance. There's this lack of confession. There's this lack of being willing to admit that they were wrong in doing this. And he was like, no, 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 it's not my, yeah, I ate the thing, but it's not my fault because there was this snake and it was talking. He's like a talking snake. What's that about? And he said, yeah, I could eat this fruit and I would be like you and so I ate it. So it's not my fault. It's the snake's fault. Okay, and God goes to Adam. Adam, what happened? Well, it wasn't my fault. It was the woman. It was her fault. Not only was it the woman's fault, but it's the woman that you sent here to me. It was just you and me before God, and there was no woman, and now you sent this woman here, and she brings me this fruit, and so it's not, it's not my fault. It's her fault, and it's your fault, God. It's your fault, God. It's your fault, God, is what Adam says. And so now there's this roadblock this, this big obstacle in the way of our relationship, humankind's relationship with God. And the reality is there was nothing that Adam or Eve or any of us could do about it. There is a roadblock right there. Only God could take care of solving this problem. Now go back to thinking about God as a parent, as our heavenly father. And those of you who are parents, 
you know this struggle a little bit, what this is like, where you need to enforce consequences, where you need to let your children make their own mistakes, you know, because if you come in and swoop them and you swoop in every time and just clean up their messes for them, they're never going to learn, they're never going to grow, they're never going to develop, they're never going to mature. But then there are other times where it's like, I got to swoop in. I'm the dad, I'm the mom, I got to protect my kids. Do you know what that's like, parents? And if, you know, those of you who aren't parents yet, you can think about your own parents. They had to deal with that with you, trying to figure out how am I going to let them, you know, how am I going to let my kids learn on their own and, and when is the right time to swoop in and, and how do I do this? A couple of years ago, I was, at a, um, I was at a retreat and I heard a speaker and he was speaking about this very issue of parenting, how to do this, when to swoop in and when to just stand back and say, you got to suffer the consequences of your own mistakes here. And he was telling a story about his daughter, one of his daughters, and um, they had an agreement with the daughter. The parents had an agreement. And they said, if you can, she was going to call it, going off to college, as long as you can maintain a B average, we're going to pay for everything. We're going to pay for your schooling, your books, your room. Everything will be covered by us as long as you maintain a B average. And she got a C. Her second semester got a C, or maybe more than one C. And so there are the parents at this crossroads. It's like, what are we going to do as parents? Do we kind of like intervene and say, okay, well, we don't want to kick you out of school, so we're going to keep, you know, whatever. What do we do? <clears throat> and so they weigh the consequences back and forth. They say, we got to stick to this. She's got to learn. And she didn't get a C because she was like, you know, I was studying really hard. I just couldn't make it. She was goofing around. She was doing that thing that like so many of us do when we're 18 and 19. She was having fun. And she let the fun overwhelm the studying and all this. And so they took their daughter out to dinner and the father said, all right, we had an agreement. We had an understanding. We gave you a rule to follow and you got yourself a C. So we are no longer paying your school bills. It's up to you to cover tuition. Now that story could have had a lot of different endings, by the way, but this story had a good ending. The girl ended up going, getting herself a job, going to a less expensive school and did ultimately graduate. She learned her lesson. But you know what? It wasn't just that one, one incident. I mean, this, this man, these set of parents, they had built this into their children from day one. I mean, you've got to suffer the consequences for your own mistakes. And so go back to God. So here's God trying to deal with Adam and Eve. He's like, guys, I gave you everything. You had everything. No cares in the world. Nothing to worry about. No burdens. I gave it to you all. You didn't earn any of it. I just gave it to you freely. I gave you one rule. Don't eat from that tree. And you broke that one rule. There are consequences. And so he had to kick them out of paradise and said, from now on, you're going to have to work. It's not going to come easy to you. You used to lounge by the river and we used to chat together. We used to have conversations and I would give you stuff to eat. Not anymore. You've created this roadblock. But take a close look when you read the account of Adam and Eve in your Bible because there's something that happens. Before they're kicked out of Eden, there's something that happens that speaks volumes about God, who he is, his love for us, and what he was planning to do in the future. What God does for Adam and Eve, I mean, you know, they realized they were naked. They made themselves some clothes out of fig leaves, right? You've seen the artwork wearing some, you know, leaf outfit. <clears throat> what God did is he took an innocent animal and he slaughtered it. As far as we can tell in recorded history, this is the first time that an animal shed its blood and God was the one doing the slaughtering. And then he took the skins from the animal and God, this is God, he made them into clothes for Adam and Eve. What a sign of love, okay? Here we go. It's like, you messed up. I'm gonna make some clothes for you. But it's bigger than just that. You see there, he shed the blood of an innocent. There's something very significant about that. And we're going to see this happen throughout history leading up to the cross. The blood of an innocent was shed. That animal didn't do anything wrong. Adam and Eve did. But God withheld his full wrath from them. He did not slaughter them. Some other substitute took their place. And so they were cast out. All right, we're still in the book of Genesis. We're going to get to the cross, though, I'm telling you. Right, we move forward in the book of Genesis, and we meet a man named Abram, later renamed Abraham by God. And God talks to Abram and says, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to make you and your wife into a great nation. I'm going to make you Israel. It doesn't use the name at that point, but I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to be my people. And through you, Abraham, and through your descendants, you are going to bless all people. 
And Abraham's like, what do you mean by that exactly? I mean, it wasn't all spelled out. God didn't spell everything out at that time, but I'm going to take care. That's what the word blessed kind of means there. I'm going to take care of all humankind. I'm going to do something to take care of all people through your descendants, Abraham, through your descendant. And Abraham says, all right, I guess. I mean, sure. So Abraham says, all right, I'll go where you lead, God, and you can make me into a great nation and you know, let that happen. And so what happens, and this is strange. Again, read your Bible. A lot of crazy, awesome, strange stuff happens. God makes an oath with Abraham. And in Abraham's time, they had this weird tradition. When two people would come into an agreement or make a contract or have an oath together, what they would do is they would take some animals and they would cut them in half, all right? So that's pretty grisly, isn't it? And then they'd kind of make this sort of runway of halved animals, okay? Should I have brought some props in for this? Or <laughs> All right. And so what they would do is they'd make this runway of halved animals, animals on either side that have been cut in half, right? <clears throat> and then the two parties would walk down this horrific runway and meet in the middle. And they would make their agreement together. And the understanding was this. If I break my end of this bargain, if I break my end of this commitment, may what has happened to these animals happen to me. Okay? Strange thing, but that was their custom at the time. That's something they did when they made an oath. And so God makes this commitment, makes this promise, makes this agreement, covenant with Abraham. And so then God does this thing of killing these animals, innocent animals. He sets up this horrific runway, okay, of split animals. And so Abraham's on the one side and God's on the other. Now what's supposed to happen? They're supposed to meet in the middle, right? Well, they don't. God says, not so fast, fast, Abraham. This thing that I've promised you, this thing that I'm about to do and taking care of all people through your descendants, this has nothing to do with you. You can't do this. This is all me. And so God walks the full runway and meets Abraham. Abraham doesn't move. And so that was a sign. That was a big sign of what God was going to do. Again, you've got innocent animals slain, you've got bloodshed, and you've got God saying, I'm going to do this Abraham, humankind, you can't. I can. I'm going to solve this problem. We move forward in time, and last week we talked a little bit about the Passover and the significance of that and how an innocent lamb was slaughtered and the blood of the lamb was put over the door and the Israelites were saved. And so the Israelites, they come out of Egypt and they're finally like their own nation and God becomes their their everything. He becomes their president, their king, their congress, their lawmaking body. He is their all in all. And he gives the people all these rules to follow. You remember we talked about that a little bit last week when God, it was like a true um, theocracy that the Israelites had. And so God gave the Israelites this sacrificial system to abide by. And it's strange to us because we don't have anything like that to compare it to. We just, there are no modern day parallels. But they had this sacrificial system and people would have to do what? They'd have to bring their innocent lambs to the slaughter. Say, this is what you need to do. So God gave the people all these rules to follow and he said, you're not going to be able to follow them perfectly. You're going to sin. You're going to mess up. And when you do, I don't want to punish you. I should, but I don't want to punish you. So you're going to take an innocent lamb to be slaughtered in your place. And when you do that, you're going to be mindful of the fact that you're really the one that deserves the punishment, but I love you so much. I don't want to do it to you. And so that was part of it. And and I mean, there's a very powerful message there. There's going to be a substitute that's going to take your place, to take your sins away. Somebody else's blood is going to be shed on your behalf. Because you see, humankind, there's this debt that we owe God, a debt that we can't pay back. I know like the word debt, that's a financial thing, but we need to think of it in those terms because the Bible speaks about it in those terms. We owe God something. We created this roadblock. We can't get rid of it. We stepped outside his boundaries willfully and we can't undo that. There's a debt. There's something we owe God that we can't pay back and God says, you can't pay it back. I am going to fix this. You created this problem, but I love you and so I'm going to solve it. We move forward in time. Jesus is born. Jesus begins at the very, you know, even before he began his public ministry, he's baptized by John. We talked about this a little bit last week. And John says, Jesus, you are, what does he call Jesus? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God, the sacrifice of God. And this sacrifice was going to be good enough to take away the sins of, not God's sins, because God doesn't have any sins, but the sins of humankind. That's, That's the first public title that Jesus is given, Lamb of God. Jesus goes about his ministry and there's an occasion that we, we read about it in, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Um, it's the Sermon on the Mountain, we call it. 
And so in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching the people and they're expecting a lot of things from Jesus and they're wondering what he's all about. Is he really the Messiah? Is he some kind of prophet? And Jesus says to the people, do not think that I have come to abolish the law. That's what he says to the people because some of the people were there and they knew this whole sacrificial system and all these laws that God had given them were just overwhelming and they were hoping somebody would come along and just get rid of it all. Like, let's get rid of all the stuff that God has asked us to do. It's overwhelming. We can't do it. He says, don't think that I've come to get rid of all that. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law. I have not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it, but to complete it, to fulfill the purpose for why it was there in the first place. I mean, the reason that, that God doesn't have us modern-day followers of you know, Christians, why he doesn't have us offering these sacrifices is because Jesus took care of this once and for all. It's not that all that law was erased. It's that Jesus fulfilled it. And so he told his followers, he told the crowd that was assembled there that day, I'm not erasing this, I'm fulfilling it. I'm not getting rid of the law and the sacrificial system. I'm fulfilling what it's all about in the first place. And so he goes on, and last week we talked about the Last Supper, and he sat down, and he said, I'm sh- you know, with his friends, with his followers, I'm shedding my blood for you. I'm giving up my body for you. This is what was about to happen. And so here's where we enter into these hours leading up to the cross. We finally made it to the New Testament, right? We finally are there. And so that night, after he shared that Last Supper with his disciples, Jesus was arrested by the temple guard, and they took him to the Sanhedrin. This was the Jewish uh, council. It was the Jewish law system. Um, They didn't have much authority. They didn't have much power, but they had this trial. They brought Jesus to trial in the middle of the night, and it just so happened that the people who were in favor of Jesus and supported Jesus and were released, you know, on the fence about Jesus, they didn't get the memo about this trial. So they stayed home in bed, and all the enemies of Jesus assembled and had this trial. And they tried to find people to speak, you know, false testimony. They were trying to find some way to kill Jesus. I mean, the scripture makes it clear. That's what they wanted. They wanted to see his blood. They wanted to see him dead. And so they try to rustle up some false witnesses and their testimony doesn't agree. And finally, Jesus says, yes, I am the son of God. And that was enough for them. And so they find Jesus guilty of blasphemy. That was the crime that he committed. Blasphemy simply means telling lies about God, okay? Which he did not commit that crime. He wasn't telling lies about God. But they find him guilty of blasphemy. Now, as I said, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish government, they didn't have any authority. They didn't have a lot of power. And they wanted this person, this Jesus, they wanted him put down in a very public way. And they wanted to, let his, they wanted to send a message to all of his followers. This is not really the Son of God. This is no kind of Messiah. We're putting him down. And so the Sanhedrin, they took Jesus before the, the Roman government, before the governor, Pontius Pilate. They said, we're bringing this man to you and he's guilty of... Well, we can't say blasphemy because the Roman governor doesn't care about blasphemy. What are we going to say? Uh, he's guilty of like treason and he's uh, starting a rebellion. He's like, well, what's going on? And so Pilate meets with this Jesus and he talks to him and the scripture tells us that Pilate understood what was really going on. He understood there was jealousy. They understood that the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were jealous of the following Jesus was growing. He also understands that Jesus was innocent. He said, why have you brought this man before me? And I love this. You got, please read your Bible. It is, it is, oh man, I tell you what. I just can't tell you the story in all its detail. It's amazing what happened. Why are you bringing me this innocent man? Pilate says, well, if he was, if he was, you know, innocent, then we wouldn't have brought him to you. Like, are you kidding me? That's the answer you're going to give? And so Pilate's question is, man, okay, what am I going to do with this Jesus? What am I going to do with him? And they talk together, and, and you know, Pilate's convinced that he's innocent. In fact, Pilate's wife had a dream the night before that all this was going to happen. He's like, Pilate, you can't, don't have anything to do with this innocent man. He's like, well, what am I going to do? They brought him to me. And so finally he says, all right, here's my plan. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this Jesus that you've brought to me, and I'm going to have him flogged. I'm going to have him beaten. I'm going to have him whipped. That ought to satisfy you. And so that's the sentence that Pilate passes down. We're gonna, we're, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have him whipped. Now, the Romans, and I've mentioned this before, they were, um, they were experts when it came to, to torture and punishment and ways of hurting people. And so the Romans had, had figured out this thing, and it wasn't an exact science, but they had figured out that 40 lashes with one of their whips was enough to kill a man. And so they had this practice of, of whipping someone 39 times just right up to that point of death. And so this was the sentence that came down. Now, like I said, 39 wasn't, you know, was supposed to be enough to keep the person alive, but the person would leave that encounter being permanently disfigured and disabled. This is something we need to understand about what Jesus went through. 
So he went there and he suffered this punishment. He, he suffered this punishment. He didn't, it was like he was paying back a debt, but it wasn't a debt that he owed. He had done nothing wrong. And so that's what Pilate decides to do to this innocent man, a man he knew was innocent. And so after that takes place, and you know, if you've seen the movies, if you've read your gospel, you know that they also take, you know, just to, to tease him, they take a crown of thorns and they press it into the flesh around his skull. And so they bring Jesus back to Pilate and Pilate, Pilate takes the disfigured body of Jesus and presents it to the crowd. He says, you hate this guy, I don't know why. You're angry at him, I'm, I, it's beyond me. But I've, I've done this to him. Does that satisfy you? And what do they say? No. That's not enough. We want him crucified. Now the scripture tells us that Pilate tried three times to release this innocent man, to release Jesus. One of the last efforts that he made, he's like, okay, listen guys, it's Passover and around this time of year, I always release one of the, you know, one of the Jewish prisoners that I have, I release him back over to you. So why don't I just release Jesus? The crowd said, no, 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 you've got somebody else. You've got Barabbas, release Barabbas. And so that backfired on, Jesus, uh, on Pilate. He was trying to let Jesus go. He's innocent and it backfired. And here's something interesting. This isn't like, I mean, again, you gotta read this for yourself. There's, there's more than I could tell you. But this man Barabbas that was released, his actual full name was Jesus Barabbas. Did you know that? That was his name, Jesus Barabbas. That was his full name, first and surname, okay? And what that means is, what Barabbas means is son of man. So you had two Jesuses, Jesus Christ, who went by the title son of man, and then somebody else named Jesus who was last name translated son of man, and they released the wrong Jesus. The guilty one, don't miss this, the guilty one went free. The innocent did not. Where have we seen this before throughout history? Where has God been doing this already? I mean, this is, it's all, you know, God, this is, didn't happen by coincidence. God set all this up to show us something about him. And so finally, I mean, Pilate, he's, he's, he's a coward ultimately. He's put in this tough spot. And he was the Roman governor and there was a new Caesar and this new Caesar was cleaning house and taking names and other governors and other outposts had been punished and executed. And so the crowd says to Pilate, if you let this man go, you're no friend to Caesar because he's trying to be a king and he's trying to overthrow the government. You got you to gotta do something about it. Pilate, all right, what do you want me to do? Crucify him, the crowd shouts. Crucify him, crucify him. And so Pilate, I said he was cowardly. But he's like, I got to find a way out of this. I'm not taking responsibility for this innocent man's death. I can't do this. And so he does this public thing where he takes some water and he washes his hands in front of the people and he says, I am innocent of this man's blood. And do you know what the crowd says back? Do you know? They said, let his blood be on us and our children. Now that's like, I don't even know how to describe that. That's one of these like, creepy, ironic, prophetic things. Because what the people were saying on the moment, no, we'll take credit for his death. That's what they were saying. But really, I mean, isn't that what we need to be saved is the blood of Jesus to be on us and, and our descendants? And so they said that. And it's like, wow, God, you're showing us. I mean, you're just, you're revealing all these things to us. And, and thank God that we live in this time where we can read about all this and see it. I mean, we have the, the you know, the, we can see it all in retrospect. We can see what actually happened. I mean, in the moment, they were living it out. We can see what all happened. And so Jesus is sent to be crucified. And he's put on the cross. And he suffers there. And then we have this moment that you heard about. The scripture passage that's in your bulletin. <clears throat> and he's there and he's suffering. And um, I mean, nobody can imagine this. I told you he was whipped, he was beaten beforehand. This, this was unprecedented in history. No one was flogged and whipped 39 times and then crucified. They didn't do that. That was wrong. Even for the Romans, that was too much. And so never before in recorded history, and probably never since, has anyone physically suffered so much, endured so much pain. I mean, he had the power to stop all this. He's God. He had the power to stop it all, and yet he gave himself up. He surrendered himself over to all of this agony, torment, humiliation. And then, verse 30 of John 19, it says, Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, 
these three words, it is finished. It is accomplished. It is fulfilled. Now, when you look to, to the Greek, and this is interesting because in the Greek, there's just one word. We have the three words, it is finished. It's just one word in Greek that I can't pronounce, okay? But it's one word in Greek, and it's an accounting term that Jesus spoke of all things, an accounting term. It is a term that they used to see stamped on debts that have been paid off. And that one term simply means the debt is paid in full. Those are the last words Jesus spoke. Your debt is paid in full. This roadblock between you and me, it's finally destroyed. What you owe God, you couldn't pay back, but I just did. And I just, you know, I I don't know what was going on in in the heart and mind of Jesus when he said those words, but there had to be this thing of saying, finally, you know, this thing that God set in motion since the time of Adam and Eve and had been building up, I mean, it was all leading up to the cross. Finally, the debt is paid in full. It is accomplished. It is finished. So, how do we respond to that? How do we respond to what God has done for us? How do we respond to this debt being paid off on our behalf? Well, I'll tell you, I think there are three, <clears throat> three basic ways that people respond to what Christ has done for us. And the one thing, the one perspective, the one approach that people take is this. Okay, there's been a debt paid off. Jesus died on the cross. But guess what? If there is a God, I don't owe him anything. I mean, what do you mean, oh God, something? What do you mean a debt has been paid? What do you mean I need to be saved? I don't, there's nothing to be saved from. There's no debt. I don't owe God anything. I'm not even sure that there is a God, but if there is a God, I don't owe him anything. That's one perspective that people take. And I don't know that ever, anyone has ever articulated it like that, but do you know what I mean? That's the one approach saying, I don't need to be saved from anything. I don't need a debt paid off for me. That's how some of us human beings respond to what Christ has done for us, okay? Then there's another approach, and this is a little bit more religious, if I could use that term, where a person is going to acknowledge, you know what, okay, I am sinful, I'm not perfect, I do step outside of God's boundaries, and so yeah, I guess you could say, oh, God, a debt, if you want to use that terminology, which is kind of weird, but sure, okay, I owe God a debt, but you know what, I'm going to be a good person, I'm going to take care of it. Yeah, there's this roadblock here, there's this debt between God and I, but I can take care of it, I can manage it. I'm going to do enough good to outweigh my bad because you know what? I know people who are really bad and they're really evil and like, well, I'm not one of them. And so I can do enough good to take care of paying off my own debt. And God says, no, you can't. There's nothing you can do to pay me back. There's nothing you could do to right this wrong. And so that's the one approach that people can take. The third approach that people can take is to say, yes, Jesus. Yes, I owe you God a debt that I cannot pay back. And since you have paid it off for me, I'm going to accept that. This is a huge gift, and I'm going to receive it. I'm not going to trust in myself and in my own goodness to take care of this debt. I'm going to trust in Jesus and what you have done for me, Jesus. You've taken care of this debt. Thank you. That's the third response that we can have to this. So I need you to think about this. How do you personally respond to what God has done for you, to what Jesus has done for you, to this debt that has been paid off for you. How do you respond? And you may think, well, yeah, I'm I'm in that third category. I know that I'm wrong. and Well, we'll just take some time to evaluate. What's your true heart response to what God has done for you? Now, the thing that breaks my heart and the thing that keeps me up at night, literally, ask Holly, is the fact that we live in a community where so many people, so many of your people, your friends, your family members, your coworkers, your parents, your grandparents, your kids, your grandkids, don't know. They just don't know what Jesus has done for us. They just don't understand that there is a debt and it's been paid off. They don't get it. I mean, there's lots of pieces of information about there, you know, floating around about, okay, Jesus and a cross and sin and salvation and I don't know, whatever. But people just don't, don't get it. It's like, I have this belief, and I think you would agree with me, that every single human being at least deserves the opportunity to find out about all this stuff. Don't you agree? 
I mean, people are going to have those different responses once they find out, but they deserve the chance to know what God has done for them, don't they? I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. They don't deserve to know. I mean, you agree with that. Everybody deserves the opportunity to find out, to hear about this, to hear this, and to interact with this. This this is what we call the gospel message. God so loved us that he done this thing for us. So I believe that. If I didn't believe that, there wouldn't be a Hope Community Church. I mean, we are, that's why we're here, so that other people can find out about what God has done for us. So that your friends that you love and your family members and your neighbors and your people in your life, your people, okay, that your people can hear this and be changed by this and have the opportunity to say, yes, Jesus, I'll accept this gift. You've paid off the debt for me and I accept that. I'll take that. Of course I will. Your people deserve the opportunity to find out about what God has done for them in Jesus Christ. That's why we exist as a church. This is the work we need to be about. Letting people know how much, no, God loves you, how much, this much. This is our work, to let people know how much God loves them. Now, how can you do this work? How can you be about this work? One of the ways, not the only way, one of the things you can do is invite your people to come to worship with you. And I know some of you are doing that. Keep doing it. Invite your people to come to worship with you because what do we do during this time? We talk about God and his love and what he's done for us. That's what we do here. That's what we're about. Your people deserve an opportunity to find out what God has done for them. This is the work that we need to be about as a church, telling other people the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Let's be about that work.